I thought I would start with that question about, you know, if you were explaining to high school kids who Maxine was, because the whole idea to me that, that there was a philosopher in our midst who did this as her day job, you know, like kids probably don't even know what a philosopher is anymore. It sounds so old world that somebody really did this with her life and sat and thought these thoughts and they had so much power for so many people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pretend that I am like, I am totally unsophisticated, I have no knowledge of teacher's college or what an education school is or even what a philosopher is. Tell me who she was and why she's important. I would just start by saying that um, she's not even a great example of a philosopher because <laughs> She was so active, and so she thought her thoughts, and they were big, big thoughts, big ideas. Um, but the the life of the mind was um, was uh, met by um, this tremendous um, drive she had to be um, someone who made a difference, who um, worked these ideas out um, to become actions and um, and I think that 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 that's partly what appealed so greatly to people um, is that it wasn't separated from the world it was very much part of the world mm -hmm. and Maxine was very much a part of the world mm -hmm. and in one minute she could be talking to you about um, uh, very difficult complex um, philosophical ideas and in the next she could be talking about a piece of theater or a piece of music or um, a work of art that she just looked at and was really excited about so I think uh, and we've actually watched her over the years I mean uh, Maxine could go into a high school classroom say or junior high school classroom and she would be as curious about hip-hop and right. anything current that the the kids would be interested in or she'd want to she'd want to know well you know show me what you're texting and like you know what's that have to do with what you're thinking about in your classes uh, but she was just so curious about the world and she was so um, an amazingly hysterical sense of humor so she can talk to anyone it seems and and somehow be right with them uh, and be sincerely so interested in, you know, the person she was talking with. And uh, I think uh, human beings respond to that, you know, no matter what the age. Uh, and I think her notion of, like, do, she always would say, I do, I'm doing philosophy. Right. You know, what's it mean to do philosophy? I do philosophy. Well, the word do is vitally important there, as Carol alluded. Um, Maxine's philosophy was so about being in the world and, and constantly questioning, you know, the nature of that being in the world and the questioning the world too, you know, how am I seeing the world? What's framing how I'm seeing? And that all came out of her philosophical orientations, existential, phenomenological, you know, and particularly she would quote Sartre so much about you know, being, um, you know, as humans, we're condemned to making meaning. You know, we must every day choose. We must choose ourselves. We must choose how we want to be in the world. And it was always about taking action in yes. the world. So, yeah. so as to make it better, whatever better might be but also as, you know, in that, in that moment. So. But also really um, uh, learning to understand the normative, the mm -hmm. what is there now, what are we, what are we living with. Um, uh, so it wasn't, um, it, again, it wasn't separated from, from reality, from mm -hmm. the world, this idea of um, seeing things as if they could be otherwise. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think Janet I hit it right on the head, you know. Mm -hmm. um, she interrogated every day, she chose yeah. um, and interrogated her memory and, and that, um, really made her a person who was um, uh, very much living in the present, but with um, uh, a desire to see the world as a better place and to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm going to end up jumping and going off my yeah, script. Jump and go. And, yeah. you know, that's what <laughs> happens. But existentialism, you know, my, and I would guess a lot of people share this that are not in the philosophical world, you know, you, you say that word and people think bleakness and, and, you know, 
French people in dark scarves. You know, Cigarettes so, and exactly. berets, right? <laughs> coffee, a lot of coffee. <laughs> a lot of coffee. Right. Um, but in fact, it, it sounds like a very joyous philosophy, at least as she understood it, because it sounds, you were saying some of this, but mm -hmm. um, say more about it. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I put in my note to you guys the, the quote of, from the atheist in the book that I had read. And mm -hmm. I that seemed very in sync with what you're saying. It mm -hmm. sounds like it's very much about the here and now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So here's a question for you. Mm. Say more about existentialism and what it meant to her. But um, I, I was very struck by the fact that when she began to do philosophy, it wasn't cool to be an existentialist in academic circles here and people wanted to do this kind of cold analytical and stuff and that she was in some way a response to that mm -hmm. if you could mm -hmm. if you could pick up on that a little oh, bit. Yes. I, we know how much she would talk about never fitting in and, and never it, it's astound her career is astounding given the times in which she entered into academe uh, given the times in which she was really pushing uh, her own thinking around uh, phenomenology you know the philosophy of the study of experience, if you will, and then existential philosophy, phenomenology, which is, you know, uh, I, you know, the, you start with Hegel, and then you go to Husserl, then you go to Heidegger, and then, you know, each is a variation on, on ideas about the, the nature of being, you know, and so it moved, if you move through those three figures, even I just mentioned, you know, there's a huge shift around, um, uh, what constitutes uh, consciousness and and being? Um, they certainly don't agree with each other, and I think Maxine, because of literature too, was so um, could really identify with the existential phenomenologist because of the constant questioning. She was all about questioning. Life is a every day is a is is a is a new beginning. You know, it, it's constant questions about. You know, sort of the existential questions, you know, as the old high school English teacher, I would say, you know, uh, to my high school students, you know, you know, what is the meaning of life? You know, where do I fit in? And that does sort of have that, you know, oh, you know, kind of thing. But she, she, she took it as a challenge, you know, and so she had students read The Plague and, you know, uh, you know she read Camus, she read... She read the philo existential phenomenologists who also worked very strongly in literature, you know, so uh, Sartre, Camus, you know, but also really took those questions that those novels even can represent and just felt that that was, that was the challenge of, of being alive, you know, what every day having to choose, every day having to confront, every day questioning, you know, but not letting that stop you, not letting that, you know, have you sink into morass? And, and that was, I yeah. think, the you know the kind of the key. The the um, um, I don't mean to be reductive at all, but mm -hmm. you know it's kind of like hope for the best, but plan for the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know if right. I, mean, yeah. I don't know she took. I don't know if um, joyous a joyous philosophy is actually the right term. Yeah, but right. certainly. I don't think she would say joyous either. No, yeah. because mm -hmm. because um, she. She understood that, that and she, she lived, really, that life is filled with um, tragedy and mm -hmm. pain, and, and, but it's filled with beauty, and art is, and, and it's filled with ways to transform yourself and your world, and that was terribly important to her, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that, that, uh, that art was her means of, of understanding that and of trying to help the rest of us to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and when it got left out of the conversation, it made her crazy, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and rightly so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, and especially for, for kids, for young people who um, mm -hmm. who are hungry for that, and and not an easy way of looking at it. Not art is pretty, art is mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, fun. It was it was much deeper than that, and she respected. Um, her students and she respected high school students and mm -hmm. you know my daughter when she was three and you know to really like yeah. Janet said kind of question and interrogate and um, create meaning. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a line in um, in Dialectic of Freedom which I didn't get very far but this <laughs> immediately laid out at me which was that 
um, reality is what's interpreted. That, um, you know, it, it sounds like, she, she said, I'm interested in the interaction between me and the Monet hanging on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, it's always transactional. Mm -hmm. It's never mm -hmm. simply looking. You're never passive mm -hmm. with art. Your seeing is always value laden. You know, you see through particular frames of, you know, your, your world views. Some people call those theoretical frameworks, right? You know, so it's never neutral. You know, it's, it's a process of constant interpretation depending on your particular situatedness in the world. And for each of us, it's somewhat different, right? So um, there, thus, thus the world is a conflicted place. You know, we see things differently. Um, but her attention was directed toward trying to, to pay attention in that existential phenomenological way, you know, that philo that particular branch of philosophy could give her the, the means to raise those kinds of questions. You know, how is it that I'm seeing things this way? You know, how, uh, you know, what has become normative about it? What has become so habitual that I, that I take it for granted when right. in fact I should be questioning it? And Maxine just would say, practically every day of her life. The thing she feared most was numbness, right. indifference, passivity. Um, she was so afraid of becoming numb. And she always talked about um, the aesthetic being the, the, um, the counter to anesthetic, to write in the words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so um, art is a way to, to, uh, to understand that. You know, you don't level everything. That's not possible. But it does allow you um, an opportunity to find intersections with other human beings, mm -hmm. and um, and that's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We we have her on tape. Um, I'm sure she said this in many contexts, and you'll know it immediately. But uh, when we did our mini moment series with her, the thing mm -hmm. we chose was her talking about the Bruegel painting, mm -hmm. um, and I. What I understood from that, and I don't know if I'm understanding it right, was that the painting is of, of a, a child who's fallen from the sky into the water, and people are walking by, and they're not noticing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what you're saying, isn't it? Right. I mean, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. So it's it's that notion of wide awakeness, um, but but it's a it isn't just walking around, you know, with your eyes wide open. You know, it's a very particular conceptual. Um, uh, term that she drew from Schutz, Alfred Schutz, a phenomenologist, and also uh, explored, I think, even deeper with Merleau-Ponty. And it's about, you know, it's a, it's a plane of consciousness that isn't just about being aware that, oh, he's fallen from the sky, and that, but what can I do about it? Right. What can I do about it? What, what actions can I take in the world, you know? Uh, Without, without becoming the messianic hero, you know, without being like, I'm going to save everyone and I'm, everyone's going to be able to transcend their particular social, cultural, historical moments and conditions. I mean, Maxine was not naive, <laughs> you know. She knew that, that this was hard, difficult, frustrating, messy work every day to choose. And that actions that you choose can have negative effects right. that, can be, that can be dark in nature right. that can be, you know, I mean, she talked about imagination too, right. as, as there can be a dark imagination. Yes, and, it, and, and she was just yeah. as um, uh, uh, frustrated with, um, with people who simplified um, those ideas yeah. and made community um, uh, always something light. Um, mm -hmm. That, you know, she, she would be the first one to say that, that um, uh, that that a group is a group by definition um, excludes somebody, um, and that 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 might be fine, but it might not. You've got to continue to question. You can't um, mm -hmm. uh, allow yourself to become complacent. Um, mm -hmm. Complacency uh, is is the death knell, sort of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for change, certainly. Um. I was thinking about the idea of community and about morality in what she talks about. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I said in one of these questions, is there a tension there between 
personal freedom and obligations to others. Um, she, there's a wonderful, again, I'm not remembering where I read all these things, but she was talking about Brokeback Mountain. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she was sort of lamenting how these two men had to give each other up and return to their families and their children. And, you know, it, it, right there you have the tension between personal freedom and obligations to others. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's other issues mm -hmm. that are in that movie, but um, wh I guess the question I'm trying to ask is um, when, she, when she talks about what ought to be in morality, is that, mm -hmm. was there anything moralistic about Maxine or was it all open inquiry? Was there a should in any of what she said? I don't think she was, I don't think I would interpret anything that she wrote or spoke about or lived as anything goes. I think that she is speaking very deeply about ethics and how people should be treated, uh, how people should treat one another. And, and so, uh, Yes, I, under I understand the, the tensions to which you're alluding. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they're there, yeah. they're implicit. You, yes. can't, yeah. you can't not um, uh, think about them, and she thought about them a lot, I mm -hmm. think, but mm -hmm. she was not um, loosey-goosey. She mm -hmm. wasn't somebody who you know, felt that anything goes, and everybody's, um, you know, if, they, if, they, if that's what they believe, then that's what they believe. You know, she mm -hmm. had a very strong sense of, um, of what's, of what's of justice mm -hmm. and of what's mm -hmm. moral, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it it at times I think it was in um, mm -hmm. intention, not in conflict with I don't think, but oh, yeah. intention, intention with yeah. um, uh, the ideas that um, we need to be open, we need to understand that we're always coming at things from our own perspective, and that that perspective um, mm -hmm. is built on um, our experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a natural tension there, but that yeah. that never prevented yeah. her, I think, from, mm -hmm. from understanding um, that sometimes you had to draw a line um, I mean, and I, fight. I, I think so, believe. too. I mean, I just think, you know, she, she kept always referring back to Sartre's, you know, you're condemned to freedom. You know, you're, you can, we're condemned every day to choose. But people can choose very differently, and people can make very perhaps what I would consider to be very negative or harmful or evil even, <laughs> you know, these, this gets really tricky to talk about. But, and, and, I, and she's, she would express outrage on, on a daily basis. Absolutely. Um, for everything yep. from the national, international news. <clears throat> like right now, I, th I keep thinking, what would, she, what would we be talking with her about in terms of ISIS know. and, you know, and everything going on in the world you know, every day she would read the New York Times. I mean, that was her ritual in the morning. And, yep. and boy, she would want to, she had very strong opinions about, you know, one of her favorite uh, lines, my, one of my favorite lines of hers, you know, how do we create just and humane educational communities would be, you know, or how do we treat one another in just and humane ways? But that's an existential question, isn't yeah. it? You know, I mean, it's... I mean, she was, she was um, very focused on... Um, um, high stakes testing on what it was doing to yeah. children and mm -hmm. teachers um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and every single thing that came out um, uh, whether it was in the Times or in, uh, from other sources she would pour over and think about and then interrogate you know mm -hmm. I mean it's funny I was sitting with my son who's a teacher um, and he's getting he was at that point getting ready to go back to school and he said um, uh, and, and he knew Maxine really well um, and he said, I wish Maxine were here. I keep thinking about her. I keep coming across mm -hmm. this, um, this quote, which it was originally um, Andre Gide, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, tyranny is the absence of nuance. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, mm -hmm. and that is partly what we deal with today on a daily basis, sort of, you know, um, as a result of the, the um, uh, the way we receive information um, and how much we can do to um, uh, to broaden the the, uh, the narrow um, understanding that comes via mostly via the media and certain aspects of the media um, and he was he was talking about um, how 
um, the public views um, teachers and teaching. Um, and I, and I, you know, I just kept thinking about it and thinking, mm -hmm. what would Maxine be saying right yeah. now? You know, how would she be talking about this? And he had the same, you know, so there's generation and generation and generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he'll work on that with the students. So it will, yeah. you know, work its way out in ever widening circles. What were the things that outraged her? Um, high stakes testing. <laughs> um, uh, just a lot of the a lot of the injustice, injustice oppression, right, um, in schools like uh, not equal access students you know and families not having equal access to particular educational opportunities across the city and you know um, uh, yeah and everywhere you know every, you I mean know. I think yeah. um, uh, the cr tremendous disparity between rich and poor mm -hmm. in our country um, mm -hmm. uh, the the the, the use of power by um, uh, large governments to the detriment of their of their people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, she yeah. was she railed against those mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of issues, issues around you know the race class gender triumph you know triad, <laughs> but yep. beyond that you know sexual orientation disabilities. I mean she just really took it all on and uh, never would back away from from calling, calling it out, you know, laying it on the table and saying, you know, what, you know, how can this be? And what can we do to make it different? And speaking you know? about it, you know, and people would ask it, her right? to come and talk um, at um, uh, little gatherings, at large gatherings, and she would do that. You know, mm -hmm. she, she, she was, um, she kind of put her money where her mouth was. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Um, I was thinking, watching the film of her, and you watch people's faces in the audience when she's speaking, and I had never seen her teach or heard her uh, teach. You know, I'd met her a few times. But did you ever hear her lecture or like give a paper? I heard her, I yeah. guess I did on her 90th birthday, uh, uh -huh. I heard her speak. Yeah. Um, but it's amazing to see someone 10 years younger than you knew them, you know, uh, kind of uh -huh. at the height of their powers. Or, um, at 80. <laughs> at 80. Yeah, right. <laughs> right at the height of her power. Right. Right. It's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Absolutely. It just, she was obviously like a really mesmerizing oh, lecture. Incredible. Um, yeah. And she read, which was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, always. She read her papers mm -hmm. um, for the most part, but you, you, it was fantastic. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, it was I, mesmerizing. I mean, she, you know, we can both word. probably imitate, you know, she'd get up to the podium <laughs> and then there she would start and it she had this you know almost habitual stance of like sort of gazing up at the ceiling in between looking at reading her paper she a little, place. A little <laughs> bit of a swaying Sometimes, you know yeah. uh, a little bit but the minute she started I mean people uh, we've just we've both been in crowds of three four five hundred six hundred people right. just in, uh, enraptured you yeah know. really she That's was true. she was mesmerizing when she spoke and, and very academic papers. I mean, these were not, you know, these weren't fluff, <laughs> right? And I saw her, um, I guess the last time I saw her speak was, she, it was, I, I would say she was 94, so she, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and she was she was sitting, um, as she did when she got older and, um, and was in her wheelchair. And she would always apologize for that. Yeah. But people had to like set things up differently for her because she was mm -hmm. in the chair. Um, she and apologized for everything. And yeah. Basically, yeah. she did apologize for everything. <laughs> um, and she was brilliant. She was talking to a group of early childhood educators. Um, and people were just rap and, and wrapped. But um, at the end of it, you know, they were coming up to her and saying, you know, that changed my life. That that um, that speech um, said everything I've always wanted to say about whatever it was, you know, in this case. It was and, and yet she would always question children. that then afterwards, if she were always. talking to you, or she would Absolutely say, Absolutely right. How could I change somebody's life in right. 15 minutes? That's ridiculous, right. you know. I'll be, I'll be happy if I find out that, you know, there was some, even if it's a small action that right. someone could take, you know, to, 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 to you know, to, in that more humane gesture toward right. making life better for some, you know. Right. And no matter but, how much praise yeah. she got, the yeah. next day she would always uh, kind of debrief and say, 
was it really good? Yeah, was it okay? Was it okay? Yeah. You know, was it really good? And, <laughs> and then she thought, I don't think it was, you know. And, but, but it would create the opportunity for her to go to the next place, wherever mm -hmm. that was, you know, um, in terms of her thinking, you know. So it was all. Well, yeah. what I was going to ask was, uh, and I really was thinking, like, why did, why did this person speak to so many people? And, you mm -hmm. know, why do we have someone who is a music professor here? Uh, a movement sciences student, right. a fiction writer, anything but philosophy, you know, right. um, and, and who you would expect to have mentors that they would put above her in their own fields, mm -hmm. say that this woman was, was it, you know, this is, the, nobody shaped my life more than Maxine Green. And I wondered if part of it was this, what we were talking about before, that you're allowed to bring in your own interpretation of life. And your you own know. experience, mm -hmm. your own... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's... that's. Um, Could you even, because I asked that, and I, I said those words, but if that strikes you as true, can you restate that for me? And, and you know, if I'm not putting words mm -hmm. in your mouth so that, so that the camera gets you saying it, not me saying it, um, is, is, the, is the openness to people's stories, because she uses that phrase, you know, I insist that people tell their stories. I think that invites everybody in, you know, and mm -hmm. that, that academia doesn't do that very much, you know. But she would always want you to question your stories. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not I, just, I, it isn't just cheerfully sitting around and let's just tell stories about our school day or our teaching or, it was, and, and it now. It was making meaning out of the right, story. And, and, right, and what, and what can we challenge that has become habitual, you know, what's become normative in ways that, actually make us into automatons, right. you know, rather than, you know, the wide awakeness of the, you know, the, the, the deep awareness, you know, that can incite action, you know. So it isn't, got to be careful around, you know, reading her as just saying, oh, everyone, let's just tell our stories. Yeah, it's, because it's, she was, you know, you've got to then question those stories, you know. What interpretations are you habitually bringing to them? How might you see them differently? What languages, discourses are available to you right now that you even have in which to tell that story? Right. What can be problematic about that? And how does that yeah. story potentially become um, a problem for someone else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, yeah, and it's great. funny because when I was thinking about that question, it, it, it's like as a result of having spent a lot of time with Maxine, bells go off all the time. Yeah. You know, you're constantly saying, oh, you know, it's true, I really kind of want to just slide into that and be comfortable with it, but I can't. I can't because mm -hmm. I know, um, I know that, you know, that she would be going, yes, but, you know, mm -hmm. well, is that really the story? Mm -hmm. Or how does that story impact the person sitting next to you who maybe had a completely different experience? So the story is important and it opens mm -hmm. up, the narrative opens up uh, it creates again an opportunity to to talk amongst ourselves, um, but then we have to go deeper, and it has to be critical. We have to be we have to have a critical sense of our own um, of our own understanding of our mm -hmm. beliefs of um, of what that story provides for us mm -hmm. and what it might represent, and what what might you question about that representation? Oh, you know, I mean, so she was not afraid to really challenge you, you know, to you know, even when we would, you know, visit just as our, you know, constant visits, it's like, what are you doing now? And then I'd say something, and then she'd say, right. really? Is that what you really think? And i go, hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was just constant interrogation. Not not for the sake of just always arguing. arguing. Yeah, no, no, not at all. At but all. it was, you know, one, she really wanted to know, you know, and then two, where where might we go with this? You know, where right. might, you know, and it wasn't like she was... Um, lecturing. It was no. just, it was, it was just kind of the constant questioning, you know, it was her mode of being. Right. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she would do the same thing to herself. Oh, gosh. She, God, she yeah. didn't, it, you know, it wasn't just asking you, you know, what you were really thinking. She would then bring that back mm -hmm. and you'd have a conversation about mm -hmm. how that impacted her. And, you know, it might come up the next day or a week later or, mm -hmm. You know, but it, it, she really thought about things. I think oh, you I said that, that, that yeah. you know, that she, she listened, she was curious, she wanted mm -hmm. to know more. Um, and then she 
laid over that her own ideas, you know, and um, and so it, it became deeper, more nuanced. You know, yeah, that nuance, nuance is, yeah, yeah. is very important. Yeah. She was quite aware, I think, very deeply aware of her own, you know, we're all conflicted, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we're all conflicted human beings. I mean, she was quite aware of, you know, her own conflictednesses and would right. raise questions around why did I ever think that way or why right. did I act that way or why? And give me an example. Uh, she would talk a lot about uh, um, uh, social mores of the time in which she grew up and like why did I think I had to be married? <laughs> why did I think I had one. to go, you know, leave, you know, one marriage ended? Why did I have to go right into the next marriage? Why? You know, what, why did I think that? But I thought that, you know, she would say, but I, I thought that. I, um, she, would, she, she really had a great capacity for, you know, that self-reflexive kind of interrogating and, and yet never denying that, yeah, I, I thought that, I did that, you know. Um, maybe even then I might have questioned, like, is this really what I want to do? But the social norms of the day, right. you know, that we all entangle you know, get entangled with, you know, constantly. Um, right. So she was, she was... I she was very much aware of her own privilege. Yeah, oh, very. Um, and it, it was always her. a tension. Yep. It, you know, it mm -hmm. was, um, you know, she suffered endless guilt about it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it um, I think, uh, impacted a lot of mm -hmm. what she did as a result of that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, she, she was, she would, she, it, it was as if she would shrink when she mm -hmm. would talk about um, uh, uh, her home um, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, the, the, the various aspects of privilege that she'd been um, exposed to from the time she was um, a little girl because she mm -hmm. grew up in a well-to-do family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so that was something. I mean, I, I, she was, you know, she would, w she would um, feel guilty about the fact that she, not all that long ago, wasn't out there on the lines with the Occupy Wall Streeters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we would kind of look at her and go, it's okay, <laughs> you're, you're 92, you're, you know, you're in a wheelchair, it's like, it's okay, you know, like you're, you're giving what you can give. But she would, she had a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, um, it was as much a part of who she was yeah. right. as, um, as uh, you know the the other part the 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 mind you know but also this very human person you know, I think I've, I've mm -hmm. told you that she she um, she at, at one point we were talking about feeling faux feeling like um, we were always fooling people um, about our as women our roles yeah. in um, in the world and um, and she said that's why I never had a card made up because I thought somebody would figure it out and take my business card away from me. <laughs> you know, this is, a, she was, she was, you know, a renowned professor, professor. Who had already been president of AERA, yeah. and yet she still mm -hmm. kind of felt like that, like, you know, like it was this aspect of um, mm -hmm. fooling everyone, mm -hmm. you know. But she, again, I think, as Janet said, she interrogated it, she thought yeah. about it, she yeah. figured out what that meant for her, and how that might also be something that other women feel. And what did that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, since you raised that, um, it's kind of flying there. Got it. Mine's okay. Yeah. Um, maybe each of you could talk for a minute just about what sh what she meant to you personally in your mm -hmm. careers. Your I know that's impossible to separate friends, careers. Uh, you know, as, as women, um, but I, I really want to, I think sometimes hearing it from the personal point of view brings out stories that you wouldn't get to if we're talking about her as a theorist, so. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, she, she was a constant. She was um, a confidant. She was um, a nurturer, um, a friend, a colleague. Um, you know, it was about her mind, but it was also about her heart. She was always, um, I mean, uh, you know, in, in, her, in the hospital uh, to the very end. Um, I mean, literally, uh, the very end. Um, she would look up at me and say, how's Katie? 
is Katie back yet? Because my daughter was coming back from, mm -hmm. um, from college at that point. Um, at, she would ask about the family. She would be focused on, on, um, on, on each of us as, as individuals. Um, so that never uh, ceased with Maxine. And yet she was also someone that you could sit with and have um, uh, a great conversation about and laugh a lot with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that her humor, you know, I think many of us felt that she was a kindred spirit. And somehow she managed to do that. Um, it was a wonderful thing. And um, did, did, I'm sorry, I don't no, want to cut No, you no, no, go ahead. Did she influence you? Can you think of things you've done in your life where you said, you know, that's Maxine talking to me uh, professionally or otherwise? Uh, were you already established in your career when you met her? I, you? I, I was reasonably established, but I think, um, uh, I think Maxine's impact is there kind of every day. When I don't fly off the handle about something, when I think about something more deeply, um, and um, come back with a response that is a little more measured, that's um, uh, thought through pretty carefully. I can hear Maxine. I can see, feel her sitting on my shoulder, um, helping me to uh, kind of, um, and, and when I question things, when I think about things, when I, um, um, uh, so it's, it's both. It's an expansiveness and it's a, um, a critical, quality and they're there together and I'm, I'm certain that I've been the most fortunate person in the world because I've you know kind of gotten it through osmosis by being friends um, I mean, we started as editing uh, editor and and author but um, we became friends pretty quickly um, so uh, I see that uh, every day and just to stay with you for a second um, you did edit her I and did. Say a bit about not only what it was like to edit her, but did did the process of editing her and being so immersed in her work affect you as an editor with other people? I mean, did was it a two-way thing where she yeah. edited your editing? I, I, absolutely. I mean, Maxine, mostly what I would do would be to, sometimes I would um, uh, make some changes, but mostly what I was doing was questioning, <laughs> which she understood very well. Um, and sometimes she would agree, and sometimes she wouldn't. And she was a very, um, uh, a really good advocate for herself. Um, but she was also, um, because I think of who she is, she was was never um, unwilling to um, understand that what you were bringing to it was, uh, or what I was bringing to it was, was a, a different understanding of, of, of her work. So, and she had to kind of take that, the understanding that I was bringing as, as what most people would be, um, how they would be receiving um, her writing. And so she would pay attention. You know, and we're always talking about her paying attention. She would pay attention. Mm -hmm. And those, um, uh, those areas that I was questioning that she agreed with, um, uh, that could be um, made better, she would make better. But other times she would fight back. You know, she would, um, she would say, no, nope, I don't really think this can be changed. Sometimes that meant we changed something else. We would look a little further down the, down the path and find something else that, you know. But yeah, she was, she was great to work with. And um, uh, it certainly set a, a bar for me because it was very early in my career at Teachers College Press. So. Can you think of any instance when you were working with her where you clashed over something or, or didn't clash, you know, had a great moment together over something in one of her books that you shaped together uh, or that just influenced you afterward as an incident? Well, I, I, I really can't because I don't feel like I, we shaped anything together. It was. Sure, sure, yeah, and yeah. I'll try not to. Yeah. Just asking again, um, you know, moments from the editing process with her that maybe stand out, and that that uh, whether you shape them together or not, sort of 
linger in your memory over on the dialectic I mean on the dialectic mm -hmm. we um, we worked most closely really much more of a line editing than what we normally do um, um, at the press and um, I can't actually recall any particular in instance but um, overall the process was beautiful you know it was oh, and again that's not to say that there weren't moments when we were disagreeing um, just that in the end um, uh, it, 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 it was done and it was wonderful it was also like I said I, I didn't help to shape it it was Maxine's mm -hmm. it was Maxine's work um, and if anything, um, maybe I was able to bring a little extra clarity um, uh, to some of the um, uh, paragraphs that, that were pretty dense because it was really complex, difficult stuff. Um, and there was no way to, um, to simplify it. Uh, all you could do was sort of work with it and, and find the best way to present it. Um, to the readers, uh, and she was very sensitive to that, and fun. You know, that's the other thing that I would say is that it was really fun working with her. Um, it was fun to um, to be working on um, a, this intellectual problem, and then the the um, the the downtime, <laughs> and there was quite a bit of that uh, where we'd go off topic was even more fun. So, <laughs> Jenna, what about you? Um, oh my gosh. I mean, I remember from the story we did on you that, you know, you, you kind of, I think, saw her from afar first, and then, you know, that she she influenced your work maybe before you knew her closely. Oh gosh, yes. Uh, I mean, I, uh, yes. <laughs> it's oh, it's really hard to um, to think of my whole academic career now without it being from almost the very beginning, influenced by Maxine. And that's because I was just very lucky uh, to be studying first with um, a person who had invited her to a conference where I was doing my master's at University of Rochester. And that was in 1973, and that's where I first heard her speak. And I was uh, a high school English teacher for seven years. I just started my master's degree had started to read Maxine a little bit in class, and then there she was, and it was like, whoa. <laughs> and I was way, way, you know, so far back in the room, and, and absolutely awestruck, but also just in, so intimidated, because um, I, I would, would you agree with me that, um, and, and certainly probably when you were, even before dialectic, but I mean, you have, Someplace you have written, or you said something about Maxine. Well, maybe it was, yeah, Maxine moving moving through the hallways, and and immediately it was, in, as you engaged in conversation, it was like what she had been reading, and right. the plays she had seen, and right. what about that movie, and what do, what do you think of this, and what do you think of that, and she was so widely read, and so deeply read, and but also so. In the, world. in the world, that that as a new master student, it was just I was, I mean you know it was just I, I wanted to be as far away as I could because it was so intimidating. Uh, but then as I started reading her and then working through my master's degree, um, and I happened to be working with mentors both at um, my master's degree and then when I went on to do my PhD at the Ohio State University as we call it. Uh, uh, studying with people in curriculum studies um, uh, who were uh, not just involved but in a certain sense f fully initiating this move to reconceptualize the field of curriculum. And Maxine was invited to all of those initial conferences uh, that are associated with what was known, what is known as the reconceptualization. So I heard her speak in 73, 74, 75, 70, I mean, just constantly. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to her in 74 at breakfast I and uh, by Bill Pinar, uh, invited me to go with him to meet her. Um, and she, she talked with me. And again, I was just so astounded that she would even, you know, I, 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 can't, I don't know how to capture how uh, amazed I was, you know. But then I just had, by then I was reading her work deeply, and by the time I was 
choosing a dissertation topic. It was on Maxine's work and its influences on the field of curriculum at that time and the reconceptualization, although she would never identify herself as a curriculum theorist, was never part of the reconceptualization that she would ever, but she has mightily influenced that field along with many, many others. So, mm -hmm. so um, by the time I was doing my dissertation, we were uh, conversing by phone uh, quite a bit and she, that's when she invited me to come to New York to interview her as part of my dissertation. Um, and that was what year? Uh, that would have been, let's see, I finished in 77, and so it would have been uh, probably late 76 uh, that I actually was doing the interviewing. Um, and she was wonderful. I mean, I stayed the whole afternoon and into the evening, and, um, you know, as I've as I've said, she baked her famous spaghetti <laughs> for Jack and me, you know, and uh, as the, it just turned to evening and I was still there and my, my old clunky tape recorder, I'd run out of tapes. I hadn't brought as many because I thought I'd be there an hour at the most, you know, terrified. I mean, but she, she was just there. She was Maxine. She was baking spaghetti for dinner. She was, you know, yelling to Jack in the other room to come and it was time to eat. And... Um, and that was the beginning of our... Uh, of a beautiful friendship. Of a beautiful, <laughs> long friendship. But also just um, the generosity that she extended, not just to me, but to so many of oh, us. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, so many, many. I think um, I, I just, like you, Carol, I feel so lucky <laughs> to have uh, met her so early. I mean, she was formative in my career. I mean, it's it shaped, I, I would say, so much so much of what I've done. You know, from her interest in, you know, at that time we started talking about um, in, in Landscapes of Learning in that book, which I believe is 78, published. Right. Um, she has a section called Predicaments of Women. And so we were really talking about what I would now identify or most people, even though it's artificial labels that I, I a lot of us have trouble with, but second wave feminisms, you know, with a, a fairly fixed identity category of women before all of the theorizing about, um, you know, any identity category as being a multiplicity of variations, you know. Anyway, uh, but we would talk for hours and hours on end, and I know with you too, I mean, just, you know. And, and into our much more recent conversations, you know, uh, really, even in the last few weeks, I think. Even, even in, in the, the hospital, hospital, right. Absolutely. Right, I remember one afternoon having a, a conversation uh, with her about, you know, what's it mean, Janet, to be a woman academic? What are you thinking now? Because we talked about it constantly yeah, as part of our sort of ongoing work together. So uh, I, I, I can't even talk about it very well. Um, I want to say, too, feel free to uh, interrogate each other in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. You don't need me. Uh, <laughs> but it's nice when you do. But also, um, go back to reconceptualizing the curriculum field hmm. and talk about what that actually meant and maybe what her influence was. Oh, well, okay. Well, um, it's a contentious term. It's a contentious movement, not embraced by everyone in the curriculum studies field by any means. But certainly, I would argue, has had a tremendous influence uh, on the shape of curriculum studies, which is the more academic um, field, you know, of inquiry, uh, and and moving, not abandoning, but trying to move the field to include conceptions of curriculum that are not just fixated on curriculum as textbook, curriculum as syllabus, curriculum as a set of behavioral objectives that can be, you know, uh, predicted, controlled, measured which is pretty much where we seem to be right back into with a vengeance, right? Um, and are we talking about curriculum in K through 12? We're talking about, it, yeah, um, okay. pre-K through whatever. But, but the field of curriculum studies is an academic field where, where the reconceptualization was trying to say that is the predominant conception of curriculum. And it's associated, this is very brief and, and condensed, but you know, associated especially with, say, someone like Ralph Tyler, and it's known as the Tyler Rationale. 
because the field of curriculum studies, which actually the first academic department in the United States of curriculum studies is teacher's college curriculum and teaching. This, de this department here is the first one in the United States. The field of curriculum emerged in the United States as an administrative move um, by a superintendent of schools who needed uh, really someone to be in charge as his school district was getting larger uh, to sort of be an overseer of content, you know, what was being taught when. So all of the curriculum phrases, which I, I do not in any way argue we have to abandon because they're very important and useful and it's hard to imagine schooling well, I can imagine, but and so could Maxine. But yeah, you know, she was good but, at but you know, the notions of scope and sequence, and you know, I mean, anyway, it's a, it's a complicated endeavor. The reconceptualization was about not saying throw that all out, but rather paying also attention to ways in which curriculum is not just this monolithic, uh, predetermined knowledge, you know, handed down by by whom, but that it's a human creation, and it's political. It's subjective. It's you know. It's it's both subjective and has tremendous political influence in the world around the the general curriculum question, which is what knowledge is of the most worth. So the reconceptualization was all about not just what knowledge is of the most worth, but whose knowledges are of the most worth and who decides. So there's a big political component to it, led by neo-Marxist thinkers such as Michael Apple, for example. I, and then uh, uh, another aspect of the reconceptualization was uh, paying attention to subjectivity. And it's very much in line, and this is where Maxine's influence was, was, I call them sort of the strands of the initial reconceptualization. And very reductionistically, I call them the political and the, the subjective, if you will, the personal, very reductive. Um, but in the personal, is about paying attention to Maxine's existential phenomenological questionings around what frames the way you see, you know, that there isn't pure consciousness. And this is where, this is why she aligns with an existential phenomenologist such as, you know, Merleau-Ponty or Schutz or, or Sartre uh, and so on, rather than say a Hegel or a Husserl who, who worked very much in, in the notion of a, of a um, phenomenology as being able to get to the essence of the self or the, you know, the essence, the pure consciousness, if you will. With Heidegger, Heidegger is the one who began to shift out of that and, and, and began to really um, say, no, there is no such thing really as pure consciousness, you know. And Merleau-Ponty, uh, Maxine really loved Merleau-Ponty yeah. especially, yeah. I think, um, you know, calling attention to the primordial landscapes, you know, are, that we all bring to our interpretations. And landscapes is still a term that Absolutely. is, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's new, but it was there for Maxine, and I, you think it was 70? I think that's Landscapes of Learning Landscapes was, of Learning was published in 78, 78 I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. and yet it's still fresh it's, it's and, yeah. um, and, and examined today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so she really influenced the whole reconceptualization because she, um, you know, she was, because of her stance about social imagination, which isn't just around, let's sit around and imagine things and be, right. you know, happy, you know, or using the arts to just imagine, you know, it's, you know, uh, to take action in the world, how could you imagine it otherwise, you know, so paying attention to that which seems to be happening right now from various perspectives. What's, what's, what is there, if there is anything there, that needs to be changed for the, to be more just and humane? I guess I would use her phrasing there. You know. So she paid a, a tremendous attention through her existential phenomenological stance around the nature of being, and being in the world for her meant leaning forward into the world, not just contemplating in a narcissistic sense the nature of my educational experience, but rather in relation to right. the world. What's going on? What's, what's normative? What's holding me back? What's holding us back? What's holding, you know? And, and her work is very political then, you know? And so she, I think, spoke to what I would identify, again, reductionistically, as the two sort of initial strands of the reconceptualization, which were the 
political and the personal. I hate, you know, it's so reductionist. Um, but she was both. She was attending to both. And so while she would never label herself as a Marxist, or she would never label herself as a, mm, I don't know, a, a, a misappropriation of uh, explorations into consciousness and the nature of being as just simply self-reflection, you know, which becomes a simplistic, I think, educational slogan. Well, she kind of hated labels. Yeah, she they hated labels. Very yeah, it was just like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. that various uh, fields um, took her on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, felt that she was speaking directly to them. Um, and and because those big big ideas uh, are are um, uh, they 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 go over the rest of what we're the rest of what we're talking about. So I don't think she would think of herself as a curriculum theorist, oh, right? Absolutely not. No. And yet <laughs> and yet she was tremendously influential. Oh, tremendously influential yeah. in that field. At, on, on many, but so yeah, there yeah. I mean, she just shaped, you know, I think she shaped, yeah, so much. I mean, and we disagreed as I moved on sort of, uh, you know, in later years to more theoretical framings that have more post-structural emphases and being on? per se. I'd be, I'm, I'm fascinated to know that. What did you disagree on? Um, I'm sorry, ma'am, before you do that, can you just adjust it? It's just a fabric. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is this was uh, Maxine's... Um, one of her great oh, issues. Center, so I was I'll thinking if I could clip it to something more. Yeah, but it's just, it's just she would always rustle. Oh, yeah. She would yeah, rustle yeah, constantly. Right? <laughs> and, right? Yeah, yeah. And some, some fabrics work better with the mic, but Had it's I very but sensitive. no. Yeah. How's you know, that? You could just lower it more to the center. More to the center. <laughs> she was the Russell professor. A little more? Yeah. Better? Sure. Okay. It's okay. You can keep. Uh, telling me to adjust. I don't. Uh, yeah. no okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so just asking where you diverged in your thinking. Well, oh, uh, uh, as I became persuaded by some, you know some the post structural theories, and and she was reading them too. I mean, she read, you know, she read Foucault, she read Derrida, she read, you know, Lacan. She read, she read, and read and read, but. Um, where we started to disagree, and, and uh, we would just have wonderful conversations about it, you know. And probably the place where we would disagree the most would be about, um, as a as a phenomenologist, she um, while she was in the existential phenomenological realm, and therefore didn't believe that there was a pure consciousness that one could get to the essence of, <laughs> but rather a more, you know. Um, Paying attention, like the Merleau-Ponty, that you know, where every every way of seeing is value laden, you know, kind of thing. Um, there was still a, a way in which phenomenology uh, accepts uh, what I would call enlightenment conceptions of the self, so that there is a um, an enlightenment conception of the self uh, assumes that there is ultimately a um, almost fully knowable, rational, conscious, fully con able to be fully conscious um, human. Um, and that, and a lot of our educational theories are predicated on all of these assumptions. So um, the notion of developmental, you know, learning, or Piaget's stages of, you know, all of the stage theories really presume um, an enlightenment version of the self. Whereas a post-structural um, a theorizing of the subject, you know, they won't call it the self, they'll call it the subject. So say Foucault, you know, there's the, the, the subject is both the subject and also subjected to. So a tremendously um, shift in, in, to discourse, to language, and ways in which dominant, so this is very Foucaultian, dominant discourses or regimes of truth, um, in fact, um, shape the way we can even think of ourselves as, as beings in the world. Why, um, why, would, why was she, 
Why would why was she uncomfortable with that? What um, was I, that? I uh, because I think she uh, I think um, we we talked a lot about I think because she want, didn't want to give up the Merleau Ponty uh, idea of the primordial landscape, and while we could certainly talk a long time about the unconscious, right? You know, uh, that certainly post structural theory is not hasn't abandoned at all, right? You know? um, but ways in which. Um, I, I wasn't I'm not I wasn't so sure and I'm not so sure now that that is ever fully accessible to us uh, as humans. Whereas she was still mightily influenced by phenomenology in terms of the notion of bracketing and epoche as epoche is the method of sort of setting aside your assumptions so as to be able to move to the essence of the nature of the being. And I'm, uh, you know, I would say, do you think that's really possible? You know, <laughs> so I did, we didn't disagree so much as we just really loved to talk about it. Right. You know, right. And right. and it depends on whom you read too. I mean, you know, post-structural thought is not one, you know, monolithic entity. I mean, you know, there are vast differences in depending on the theorist you're reading, and and so too in phenomenology. So I mean, it was just it wasn't so much disagreements as we would just have these fabulous conversations where neither of us knew. We, we didn't have any answers, you know. <laughs> but we loved to talk about it. Um, and she, uh, she I, I think she, like in Shapes of Childhood Recall, ch Shapes of Childhood Recall, Shapes of, did I get that right? No, no. It's one of the chapters in, um, is it Releasing the Imagination? M maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She talks a lot about the primordial landscape, you know, and and then ties it to her memories as a child right. growing up and so on. And we just talked a lot about memory and, and what was supposedly retrievable and, and how, and I would be a little more post-structurally inclined to say, well, memories, you know, what we can articulate are also shaped by time, the passage of time and, uh, you know, all kinds of things that we can't fully control but also you know meanings change over time and every time we tell a memory we're reshaping it and you know all of the vagaries of the unconscious I don't know those are a lot of meandering this is kind of the meandering we <laughs> did <laughs> meandering but we just I, we really enjoyed talking about that um, yeah no, I mean she comes from a tradition of oh, yeah, yeah. Of, um, of discussion slash argument, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it was very much a part of um, her, uh, her culturally, her um, growing up, you know, that's, that's who she was, so that's who her family was, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, um, I, there's so many ways to go from each question, but I do want to ask this, it sounds like, um, I, I raised the idea, question of, of disciplines and looking at the world from disciplinary perspectives, um, and that if, if, would Maxine have called herself more interdisciplinary than transdisciplinary in the sense of, um, and I have a reason for asking this, which mm -hmm. is that um, I'm doing a piece right now about how our faculty is changing, how we've hired so many new people in the last few years, and older folks moving on, passing away, whatever, mm -hmm. and what, what ideas have stayed and what are changing. And an issue that keeps coming up is whether formal disciplines matter. And some people are very adamant that they do because they shape the questions and the, and the research that you do. And that, yes, collaboration should occur, but it should occur once you've staked out your territory and then you speak to people in other disciplines and you collaborate, versus people who talk about interdisciplinary and say, well, the boundaries are collapsing because you can't look at a child, for instance, and not ask about health, not ask about, you know, psychological well-being, ask deep philosophical questions. Um, and so we should be preparing our next generation of thinkers in an interdisciplinary mode, you know. Um, maybe it's just a bunch of hot air and it doesn't matter, but I wonder what she would say about that. Um, it sounds to me like she's interdisciplinary because she just crossed lines all the time, right? Well, I think I mean, the first thing she'd say would be to watch the labels. Mm, exactly, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, she would warn us to mm -hmm. watch 
the labels and make sure that we're not getting bogged down in something that was less important than the big idea, whatever that big idea is. Mm -hmm. I know we talked about interdisciplinary um, uh, publications years and years ago, and I mean like two and a half decades ago, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and shared experiences, you know, and, and some frustrations in that... Um, uh, very much the way the academy is set up makes it very difficult yeah. to bring in um, a, a, a multiplicity of disciplines to actually care for whether it's a child or a senior um, or any of us in between. Um, uh, it, it, it's as if um, uh, the structure of, um, of schooling uh, it rejects that. Idea and and Maxine could go back in history and and trace that for you. Um, and I was looking at it from the point of view of a, of a publisher. You know, we should be producing volumes that um, mm -hmm. bring into uh, play multiple um, disciplines because we need to know about health. We need to know about um, education when we're looking at. Um, uh, we need to know about the economics when we're looking at uh, uh, the lives of children. Um, and you know she 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 had she had no answers because she would never you know questions are the answers you know that's what I think mm -hmm. I think that's what she would that's what she would say more mm -hmm. questions you know yeah. um, but she certainly had been thinking about it for a long time I don't know exactly mm -hmm. what she I would think say I think you're correct that she would just say uh, 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 reject the labels you know that I think I mean it just reminds me of her her thing about social imagination, you know, it's, it's the capacity to imagine and envision that which could be and should be in our deficit society, you know. So there's the action. And to imagine right. and envision, you know, don't let disciplinary boundaries or silos of, you know, departmental, you know, uh, labels uh, stand in my way of, of how I might work to imagine envision and take action on something that so I, I right I, but know, and I, and I think yeah. again back to you know she would also say um, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater yeah, right, you yeah. know don't you know that's not a good thing either mm -hmm. you know if there is um, uh, a reason for certain um, formalities mm -hmm. then then maintain them mm -hmm. but think it through ask the questions mm -hmm. um, yeah. don't make assumptions mm -hmm. um, that 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 triggered my what you just said um, in terms of uh, not being able to say would she be trans or inter or, you know, you know the intersectional you know, right. kinds of things that are going on now. But rather, um, when someone would say to her, and I've heard, I've heard students say this to her, why do you write, why is it so difficult? I don't, you know, why aren't you more accessible? Right. And she would say, do the work do the work. And for that, she was saying, you know, go read Sartre, go read Merleau-Ponty, go read, because she also, you're right, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater is right. what triggered that in me. You know, it's like particular disciplinary histories do have, you know, do have histories. And here are, you know, multiple readings and theorists and scholars attached to that. And so, um, if you want to understand, you know, more clearly my work, do the work. Right? And I, yeah. I think that she would say that in a way um, that allowed students to feel respected. Mm -hmm. yes, so she, she would say, do the work, and, and hidden behind that was, I know you can. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, and that was tremendously um, energizing to her students. Um, and it, it, it allowed them, I think, to walk away uh, with a sense of I can do this, I'm you know I'm, I'm Maxine thinks I can do this. I must be able to do <laughs> yeah. this. You know, it's like so. Yeah. 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 Here's here's a, a big question, and um, it it can sound maybe pejorative, but I, you should answer this any way that appeals to you. Um, and that is, if you if you go beyond the ideas that she articulated, what what did Maxine do that that had concrete impact, you know, and so that could range from, Oops. you know, um, Sorry. Yeah, sure. And 
going to slip that back there and hope it stays. We're good? Yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to get at her impact in the world. And when I ask what did she do, it could be anything from, you know, uh, you know she, she started a foundation that, launched, that gave grants and things came out of them, to, as you said before, she had an impact on a range of fields, you know, and we can say that in this field, you know, this is going on because of something Maxine said mm -hmm. or did. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm thinking back to that high school class that you go into and you explain who she was. And why, why was this person important? What, what was the impact of her ideas? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, I, you know, as a publisher, I would start with her writings. You know, they, they're... I think very influential and again and have had um, great impact on um, uh, of, a variety of constituents so um, teachers in the classroom um, the teachers of teachers um, superintendents principals mm -hmm. um, you know it, it just ranged uh, all over the place and her her even though her writing is um, uh, complex. Um, I, I wouldn't say not accessible, but it is really complex and you really have to do the work, as Janet said. Um, I think that, that her accessibility, um, if you wrote Maxine, if you yes. emailed her, if you came to visit her and she invited everybody all the time, <laughs> um, you could ask those questions directly at, at, um, at her lectures, at um, events. She was so accessible. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so I think that that combination was um, was very special. I also think that the that the foundation that um, uh, the Green Grants, as they were called, mm -hmm. um, were wonderful. And um, and there are uh, I think people that are dancing and making music and um, making art today that you know that got through as a result of the help. They weren't big grants, but they were important. They were at important moments in people's careers. Mm -hmm. Schools too. Mm -hmm. You know, she gave them out um, uh, to individuals working, um, but also to schools, to programs. Um, and they ranged. They really ranged. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was kind of a wonderful thing. I think also she's, she's read not just in the United States, but she's read around the world. And so uh, uh, people, uh, you know, have corresponded to me, and I'm sure you too, you know, from China, from, from Australia, Australia, from, uh, oh, okay. uh, and, and because she also influenced so many different um, fields of study, um, from curriculum, for example, to art and art education, and um, I've, I've met nursing students at conferences and qualitative research who, you know, build their whole you know, qualitative inquiries around Maxine's, you know, writings. Right. Um, what would a nursing inquiry? Nurse, they, they do a lot of qualitative research in, in case studies in, in nursing, especially. And uh, so it's a big arena um, with the qualitative research. And medicine, you know, the idea right? of narrative, the idea of, idea of, right, of um, patient, um, the importance of, of patient questioning stories, right. your patients mm -hmm. to understand um, mm -hmm. uh, what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know. So I think it, the influence on the various, if you want to say, disciplines or fields of study, to me are astounding. I mean, they go way beyond what we would more narrowly describe as educational, you know, subfields of inquiry, for example. Um, but, you know, you have MDs, you know, talking of, about her work, nurses, um, you know, healthcare practitioner, you know, um, social workers. Social workers, especially. A lot of social workers. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, her sister was a, in social work, you know, an academic. So that to me is, is I think, amazing. I think that uh, yeah. it's part of her amaz amazingness, you know, is that she just influenced such, such a wide range of, of um, people around the world. Um, so... Um, her teaching, um, teaching. Uh, a stint with uh, Lincoln Center, philosopher in residence mm -hmm. at Lincoln Center, 
and um, droves of teachers, you know, would come in and work with her. And she would be giving the big keynotes, the lectures mm -hmm. um, at the beginning and end, but she'd be in those workshops, those small workshops, taking her shoes off and, you know, running across a, a mat or dancing or um, whatever. She's usually not singing. That wasn't something she no, did too yeah, much. But, she would, um, yeah. she but would say, don't acting, ask me to sing, right? <laughs> acting, you know, if you, not that long yeah, ago, she yeah. was on stage at an off-Broadway theater doing a, a piece for, for for someone who mm -hmm. wanted and you know, I mean, wow, <laughs> yeah. it's like amazing. Yeah. Um, you talked at the beginning about her sense of, you know, her own privilege and her guilt about it. Was she someone who inspired revolution with her thinking in a political way, or was it more sort of an approach to life way? Are there, you know, I think both. I do too. I, I, I do. I mean, I yeah. think that there are there are groups out there right now that were um, uh, formed in Maxine's dining room. You know that mm -hmm. are. Um, you know, she she certainly wasn't someone who was um, that comfortable or familiar with um, uh, social media. But I think if you were up on um, on Facebook or somewhere, there are groups that are. Uh, trying to make changes to and transform um, the landscape of education, public mm -hmm. education, a as a direct result of Maxine's mm -hmm. um, influence, and not just her influence, but her support. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we, we can't forget, I mean, she, she was off to fight the Spanish Civil War. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, she literally and was standing on street corners giving political speeches, and uh, I mean, she, she was on the boat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> along with the war. Sure, along absolutely. with um, her yeah. daughter's death yes. and the Spanish Civil the that that moment when mm -hmm. she chose. Um, did she actually go fight in the Spanish? I mean, what 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 did she do? She was on um, a <laughs> boat that almost sank on its way to um, the Lincoln Brigade, and yeah. she stayed in touch with the Lincoln Brigade forever. You know, I mean, she, I, I think she had a meeting in an airport mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a few years ago with one of the... Wow. Uh, yeah, so um, everything, you know, leaflets, the, the works. Yeah. You know, she was... Um, I think that sense of agency that came as a result of that was an influence yeah. her whole life. Mm -hmm. um, How old was she then, uh, I guess? Was well, was what, the, um, 29. So she was in her 20s. In her 20s, yeah. Now you started to mention her daughter just now. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I had not known until I was reading, I think yesterday or the day before, that her father had committed suicide. Yep, mm -hmm. that was another big, big mm -hmm. one for her. I mean, what did she say about those events? What, did, what do you know of mm -hmm. her in, in response to those events? Well, she, she, with her father, I mean, she was, she was young, but not a, a, a little mm -hmm. child. And she has very vivid memories of, of um, what happened, how it was handled, um, uh, and then reflecting on it later. Mm -hmm. So as Janet said, the self-reflexive, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think, came in very strongly there. I think that, the, the, um, the Spanish Civil War, her marriages, mm -hmm. um, and her children, and Linda, Linda's death in particular was... Um, uh, devastating and um, you know she she I didn't know her then I, I met Maxine um, a few months after Linda died um, and the book um, the dialectic was um, is dedicated to, mm -hmm. to Linda um, and it was a while I think before she talked about her um, but when she did, uh, it was a very complete picture of who this young woman was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, again, you know, it, it, it moved her in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 uh, it was its own thing, and nothing can, you know, sort of change that. But it, it uh, became something that she thought about a lot and that I think um, allowed her to be even more accessible um, to students, to friends, to um, and in her writing. So, 
Yeah, I'm, there's not much to add from that. I mean, I, she was devastated. I mean, we know that. Yeah. And she was, I think she just adored Linda. Uh, in she was a musician. She uh, was... Um, classics. Yeah, um, she was yeah. Uh, a very um, accomplished and uh, beautiful young woman, mm -hmm. I think. And that was, it was mm -hmm. a very, was, you know, everybody says, what could be worse than that, losing a child? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in the movie, um, again, it talks about her, her tragic sense, her, and, the, and she even says that she looks at education philosophers like Dewey and Horace Mann as being perhaps too positive, or um, is, it, is, it, is that kind of thinking coming out of personal tragedy, or, is, or was that view always there, do you think? Uh, I don't know if I could... I would have to say, of course, you know, even if it's un not particularly articulated by her as such. I mean, I would say, how could those not have affected, you know, how she sees it? But I think it's also her philosophy, you know, the philosophical orientations that she did um, believe in so strongly, you know, which is, um, uh, you know, the constant questioning. Right. And, and the, the not, not the, the more developmental assumption that, you know, we can all progress and, you know, by age 10 we'll all be able to do this. And then I mean, she was very conscious of how that kind of... Um, is limiting. That, it's very limiting. And it also sets up norms and abnormal then. You know, here's the norm and then here anyone who doesn't achieve at that particular age frame and, you know, ability level is considered abnormal in a lot of ways. And I think she was incredibly sensitive to the to the ways categories got constructed right. out of those kinds of assumptions. And, and the turn, you know, she would always mm -hmm. see the other side. So right. she might believe that something was um, uh, a, a good thing. I mean, I can remember her talking about social emotional learning and um, and at the same time that she would be saying, you know, this is, you know, this is such an important um, this is so important to children that we pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. She would say, how can this be a separate part of the curriculum? How can we separate mm -hmm. this out? It should be woven into everything, you know, um, not grafted on. So, you know, everything she thought about, she would um, think about twice mm -hmm. <laughs> or three times mm -hmm. or five times yeah, or however that. many yeah. times it took to... Um, to come to a deeper understanding of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that was true in her personal life, and I think it was true um, in, her, in the, uh, the life of the mind, in her, um, in everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think she really, you know, she, I think she clung to Sartre's notion of, you know, she, she transposed it, at, you know, he talks about the project, you know, and so for her, education was a project. And, and you know, by that it's like the, the constant leaning into imagining, envisioning, and acting on, you know, what might be, you know, what might be in that deficit society, as I said earlier. So, you know, uh, even in relation to, you know, very uh, life challenging, devastating moments, you know, in her own personal life, um, she chose every day to, to go on. Not without great thought. I right. mean, you know, she, 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 very human. I mean, she would become depressed. She would become um, worried. Anxious. Right? Anxious, quite Absolutely. anxious. I mean, it's not as though she... Angry. Angry. She'd, she'd become angry. angry. She yeah, was, she'd do all so it's that. not as though we don't want to paint a picture by any means of... You know, she woke up every day ready to go. Fight. No. You know, it was a real struggle. And, it was and, a struggle to choose every day. And, and that's what that, she's so deeply, I think. Right. Was. And yeah. you, you, were, you focused on something very good, I think, when you said, you know, uh, how, does, how, do, how do we not romanticize her? How mm -hmm. does that, yeah. you know, and, and I think it's very important yeah. that, that we guard against that yeah. um, because she would hate it. Oh, she would hate it. So. Um, she would really hate it. <laughs> she would um, always say, I am not an icon. I am not an icon. And then we would say, oh, we think you are. Or, we'd oh, say, no, or, or I would say, well, <laughs> but you're an iconoclast. You know, right. I mean, that's for sure. You know, I mean, you know it, it, it was, it, she was uncomfortable with that yeah. because she felt anything that, 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 that set something in stone. Yeah. You know. She couldn't be, keep becoming then. Right. If you, if you make her an icon, a fixed entity, you know, her whole thing, as we well know, is every day. I am, uh, I am, am what I am, yet, not yet. Right, not yet. So, so, but not without its deep 
you know, I would say angst oftentimes and anguish and, you know. Yeah, no, she, yeah. she was, she would definitely not want that. Mm -mm. It would be um, anathema. She would really be uncomfortable mm -hmm. with that. I have, I have more questions I could ask, but I'm, um, I wanted to ask you guys, like, what, what have we not talked about? What mm -hmm. hasn't, has it been personal enough? Have you gotten to say things that you really want to say? Um, I think so. I mean, the only thing I was feeling was that maybe we didn't focus enough on social justice, on these, those ideas mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not, but we did, you know, we, it, we may not have yeah. specifically said it as many times as mm -hmm. we could have, but um, it, it came up every step along the way here. Um, That's the, one of those phrases that goes in and out of vogue and well, it, yeah, I mean, she preferred social imagination. Mm -hmm. Social imagination. Mm -hmm. um, that really, she really yeah. preferred that. Um, but the idea that, that we, we had a responsibility um, to um, take care of each other and to, um, to use our imagination for, um, for, for good mm -hmm. um, uh, and to understand imagination as something deep and broad, both, mm -hmm. um, was terribly important to her, um, that, that we not separate ourselves, especially, I think, in the academy from the world. Mm -hmm. right. um, Very much that so. we understand right. that we have something to, mm -hmm. um, to bring to the mm -hmm. conversation and to the table, right. and that we need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so. and, and she was also, at the same time, very concerned that, you know, and we've talked about this, the notion of her social imagination or wide awakeness not become trivialized, like, uh, you know, frankly, what a lot of us worry about, the, the slogan of social justice has just become that. Because it's slogan. become a slogan. That's right. So what, what do you, you know, what, kind, what, what meanings are you bringing to that? What, you know, how are you conceptualizing it? You know, who's, who do you imagine as being able to act, you know, act? I mean, she would raise all of those questions, but she, also gets, she was not happy when people would say, oh, let's just use our imaginations. And it was right. like, no, this is not what she's talking about, you know. So a trivialization, uh, you know, she would hate being romanticized, but she would also hate being trivialized. Right. And her, you know, she had very, very... Only two are usually pretty closely linked, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think they are. Uh -huh. I think it, because it's, it's, um, it's something for people to grab onto. Yeah. Um, but the end, which is fine, but then the end result of that is, um, is, an, is a narrowing. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think a marginalization, and I think she was very aware mm -hmm. of that too. You know, what, what existed on the margins, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, and how do, you, um, uh, how do you expand that? How do you create um, uh, more space um, for, for multiple ways of knowing, ways of thinking, mm -hmm. um, ways of being? There was a story in the paper today, my boss flagged it when I came in, about China and um, how the ruling party has just announced an, an initiative in universities. They're going to appoint ideological overseers. <laughs> it's a little scary. It's like we just went oh, back 20 years. Wow, um, 30 years. And to ensure that, uh, that academic life is basically in harmony with party thought, um, and that that a consensus not be destroyed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I, I, why did I bring that up? I guess because um, the phrase social justice. I, she said some wonderful thing in, in something I was reading about slogans and how they can be misappropriated for any use and how the Constitution and the, the uh, Bill of Rights have become things that so many mean-spirited people mm -hmm. seize upon mm -hmm. and use for their own ends. And, you know, you could, you could hear in the, in the Times' coverage of this, they, they were quoting people in the party who were announcing this. And, you know, you could, you could think, well, gosh, we have civics courses here. You know, That'll never happen. Well, no, actually, I was thinking how um, if I were in China and I was reading what someone here said about a civics course, they might say, well, why are you getting angry about us having ideological mm -hmm. overseers? You do it with democracy. You know, mm -hmm. you preach that everybody should be 
you know, thinking like they live in a democracy. Well, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> if, if it's really that you can be in a democracy and you're free to think and it's open-ended and it's just participatory process, great. But, but if it's, you know, the second you become prescriptive about it, right, then it yeah. becomes something else. Mm -hmm. So that seems like territory that she would have had a field day about. with. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. She yeah. would have loved that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She would have like... Torn right into it. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But again, I think she would have seen many pieces. It mm -hmm. wouldn't have been simple. No. Um, because I think freedom and democracy were concepts that were, um, uh, I, I think, had already been um, reduced uh, mm -hmm. in, our, in, in our understanding. But, uh, but that... Even I think she would say they're, comp they're they're so complicated and they're so messy to begin with, yep. um, and you know the individual would come in and uh, you know uh, it, it would it would be a very complicated conversation in the best sense of the word. <laughs> messy messy was a word that showed up in her nostalgia for the '60s and '70s here, and and. Uh, you know, classrooms being taken over. Sure. And yeah. She liked that. Yes. Oh, she loved. That was her favorite decade. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I I, I put yeah. that down also when, when I was thinking about sort of um, uh, what had tremendous impact. Sit-ins. You know, the mm -hmm. whole mm -hmm. that that whole period, the protest mm -hmm. period. The marches, was, right? She yeah. loved that. Yeah. She was she was in her element. Yeah. Because not even so much because of whatever goal was on the table, but right. just the whole questioning process. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and she, she would be as, again, uncomfortable with dogma and with um, uh, moving in that direction, which I think was uh, very much um, a possibility in the 60s. Um, sure. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but she'd be the one who would, um, who would offer the alternatives, who would say, well, wait a minute, you know, let's think this through. Um, and I think she was in her element at that moment, too. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, it's very true. How are we doing on time? Right? Pretty good. Yeah. What time is it? Is it? Uh, it's about I'd have to get seven my, to one. Seven to one? Yeah. Can we go to right up to one? Is that okay with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I just have to be back in okay. my office for yeah, a meeting. Me um, <laughs> maybe a good way to finish would be um, the question of just what was she, what was she proudest of? And what might mm -hmm. she have been most regretful about, you know, unfinished business or? Um, mm. I, I well, here's one thing. I, I somewhere I read that she had written two novels that she never published, and that mm -hmm. you know it's, it's kind of amazing that she didn't. I mean, it seems like that that would have grown so naturally out of who she was. But we've got we've got some materials, you know, in the big archive, you know. She was a pack rat. She saved everything yeah, she in that did. apartment. She so we have stuff that you know I'm calling through now to get into pocket knowledge, and uh, we have actual. Uh, I have some actual manuscript pages from. Um, some of it's in you know her handwriting. Right. So distinctive, but you know, and then she would always type out all of her paper. But she would just say. To me, I don't know what would she say to you. She said, "It's bad. Yep. It's bad." That's what she said yeah, to me. I don't want it published. It's terrible. No, nope. horrible. I no. wasn't good at it. No, I wasn't good at it. I wasn't good at it. Okay. She tried poetry. She's written poetry. Then she would say, "Nope, that's not. It. No, it's yeah. terrible." She loved Elizabeth Bishop. You know, yes, right. For example, but no. She liked white men going after whales, didn't she? She, she said. <laughs> <laughs> She was appalled sometimes at how much she, she when loved she, would, that. she, <laughs> she loved, loved Moby Dick, and she would say, "Oh, oh, oh dear! I really realize how much I love the white male European authors." You know, she would feel very with guilty regret. About I mean, she had regrets, yeah. but she she also understood, um, and I think she believed strongly that that um, that individual works of art, again, transcended mm -hmm. sort of the, the the even the time. You mm -hmm. know, they they were. Beyond that, and yeah. so Moby Dick certainly was one of them. Yeah, absolutely, um, that would make sense though if if what she was about was sort of, you know, agency, and you you have to make decisions every day, and you're sort of up against the unknowable, but you're you're go marching on. I mean, mm -hmm. that isn't that mm -hmm. sort of Moby Dick in a sense? Yes, <laughs> but I think that Maxine wouldn't necessarily make excuses. 
you know what I mean? Or try to, I shouldn't say it that way, that she wouldn't um, feel that she had to have a reason. Mm -hmm. um, when, it, mm -hmm. when it comes to um, works of art, yeah. she was very comfortable sort of just understanding that, that, that there was something transformative in them. And so whatever they gave to her as the reader and whatever she could then give back, um, created opportunity to mm -hmm. uh, and moments um, for other things to happen. Um, so it might have been um, the writings of a white male, but yeah. <laughs> you know, of privilege. But you know, but through that, um, working with her students, talking about that, other things came out, mm -hmm. and um, she was very comfortable. I think she was really comfortable oh, with that. Yeah. Um, so, so again, let's maybe just what she was proudest of. But what do you think if she were reflecting back on her life and saying, you know, that that's the thing that I did that I can't, I I I've never I don't ever recall her using the word proud. Yeah, I don't either. Actually, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm proud of. I don't know how she how she would how respond she, to that. Yeah. Her children. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe her her children, um, maybe um, the the uh, relationships that she formed, mm -hmm. maybe the the um, the fact that that many people stayed um, uh, close, and mm -hmm. um, you know, so I'm sure her teaching would be something that I she. Teaching, I mean, yes. I just don't think she'd she'd say it that way. She wouldn't. But yeah. I do think that that would be yeah. I, I, I agree. what she would feel. Mm -hmm. And you both told me to read Dialectic of Freedom. Is that the book you both admire the most, or is that too is that too narrow a question? It's a narrow question. I I also adore Teacher a Stranger, um, and and Landscapes of Learning and Landscapes of I, I like them all. So um, me too. Talk about Teacher a Stranger for just a minute. Oh gosh, that's even earlier. That's even earlier. That's right? 60, what, 68? 60, yeah, 68, 67, somewhere around there. Something, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, I just think she was so visionary. I mean, she really takes up uh, at that, in that moment, especially in the 60s, cultural moments, cultural, um, anywhere from um, movies to, uh, but she develops this metaphor of teacher as stranger. Um, that I think is so powerful uh, in terms of, you know, what can you, as you recognize yourself as, in many, multiple meanings of it, you know, a stranger to oneself, stranger to, you know, what does the vantage point of looking at, say, teaching, pedagogy, curriculum, and so on, as a stranger? And it's all part of that resisting, fighting, the habitual ways of seeing, the numbness, the automaton, right. you know. Positioning, and she uses a vast array of culturally, at that moment, really culturally relevant, situated, very U.S. centric. Um, yeah, I mean, it was all. something we always kind of wanted to, yeah, to go revise, back to right. and revise Update and talk about it. Update cultural references. Yes, because yeah. you could, mm -hmm. you could go back to it. And Were you her editor for that book? No, mm -hmm. not, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it, I just think it's, it was quite visionary. Uh, in terms of picking up on cultural moments, right. cultural artifacts, cultural, and really working with them uh, in some, I think, very new at that in, in those times, very new ways. Yeah. Was it was it a book that teachers read? I mean, was it did it become something that you know, my students did? Yes, and, yeah, I, I yeah. think in um, yeah. in classes mm -hmm. like the ones that Janet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> teaches. <laughs> yes. But not, uh, I wouldn't say, um, mm -hmm. in a uh, widespread, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, dialectic really yes, probably. went in, mm -hmm. and, and that, was, that was picked up. A and that's quite difficult. And then releasing, releasing the was a, was a yeah. much um, uh, more accessible. Yeah. And blue guitar is, yeah. you know, is very, and you know, we've we still got these in print, and you know, mm -hmm. they, they sell. Um, people want to know about that, so mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. kind of wonderful. Yeah. All right. Well, last words, thoughts that you guys want to offer? Oh, yeah. thanks. Thanks for this opportunity. For yeah, you know, for us to just sit and. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that I think that she um, is who she is, and I think that because of that, 
we probably don't have to worry very much about her influence going on. Mm -hmm. um, it will be, it, it, it will, just because um, it, yeah. it stays it's, fresh, it stays it's real. Enormous, yeah. um, it's timely. That's what I think. It's is always so, timely. It's That's always what's so timely. interesting. That's what I think is so, yeah. maybe if I had to pick one identifying, you know, if I think I'm thinking about Teacher a Stranger and how timely that was, right? But how current it is now. It's in a, so many ways still. And she would be very that. proud of that. Yeah, I think. So I mean, too. I think she'd I really think so be too. proud of that mm -hmm. because she really believed that you needed to be in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you needed to have whatever that moment was. You needed to bring into it everything that came before and think about where you were heading you know this um, uh, to see the world as if it mm -hmm. could be otherwise but be in the moment so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's really true mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we miss see. her very much yeah, yeah. well yeah. that comes through yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah I feel I feel very lucky that um, I had the opportunity to do this because I I didn't meet her until you know maybe two or three years ago, uh. so I didn't ever have the chance that a lot of people, you know, there's so many people at TC who took her courses, were in her apartment, you know. Right. Yeah. I, I came very late to the party, but um, now I'm getting a chance to read this stuff and, and yeah, I mean, look how much you already have. Yeah. Well, it's penetrated, you know. It. Yeah. And it, so um, that's why that you don't you, you don't necessarily. I'm very grateful. I know Janet is mm -hmm. that we had that opportunity, but really um, her work speaks for itself. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And future generations of mm -hmm. teachers that mm -hmm. were influenced speak. And not just teachers. Not I mean, just teachers. I was yeah, saying, and not just teachers. Well, this issue of the magazine, you know, if I weren't even doing this interview and this piece, by sheer happenstance, we have, um, as I said, a, 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 a former dancer who's here as a movement scientist, um, and we have a professor whose work we're sp uh, spotlighting, a music professor, and they both talk about her as the most important influence in their lives. Yeah, that's so. that's wonderful. That's yeah. uh, mm -hmm. that's so true. Yeah. yeah. So. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.